All right. Welcome back, everyone. I am so excited to introduce my guest today. It's somebody who I've been following on social media for a number of years now, although we were just talking and I don't even remember how. Uh, this is Ari Kardosh. Uh, Hello. That, yeah, I, I completely admire. I just finished your, your audio book for the second time. Um, how oh are gosh. you today? I'm so good. I'm I'm so excited to be here when you reached out and invited me onto this podcast. It's like, yes, I am so there. I love it. Yeah, it's always it's always fun when you can get somebody too that you really like admire. You're like, oh, awesome. I saw your post and I was like, yes, I'll have I me, pick me, pick me. Ah! So, <laughs> so good. Uh, but yeah, I so we're gonna be talking about a lot of different things today. But to get started, how about you just kind of give the listeners a little bit of an overview on who you are, what you do, how you came to be involved in this work? Start there. I would love to. I would love to. So actually, I am realizing that I forgot to ask you a very important question. Okay. A very important one. Who who is tuning in today? Who Who is like, if I'm talking to the listeners' hearts right now, who am I talking to? Hmm. Generally, I would say there are a couple of different demographics, I would say, that listen to the podcast. There are people who are incredibly sex positive um, and mm -hmm. who, you know, may even just listen because of the title. <laughs> And then there are people who, uh, you know, I always say that the podcast is about dating, relationships, sex, and self-love because without a base of self-love, mm -hmm. all of those other things will not flourish at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so the other group of people that I would say would be tuning in are people who are very emotionally intelligent, very aware and committed to learning about themselves and about relationships so that they can have the best partnership with, you know, one person or multiple people uh, that they can potentially have. So, yeah, I would say it's a it's a mixture of like sexy listeners and and people who are, um, you know, here for the more emotional component. Yeah, beautiful. All right. Let me let me answer that question now. Thank you for taking <laughs> that time. So a little bit about me then. I would say this, I, I could go on for hours about my journey. I love my journey. It's been a wild adventure, but l I will say that the the big highlights, if I was walking you through like the, the key points are, I uh, am a best-selling author of a, of a book called Relationship Agreements, and I'm the owner of a company called Relearn Love. And I love, love, love teaching people about healthy ways to be in love and relationships. It doesn't matter what your structure is, doesn't matter what your background is. It's like, we all, we all learned love in some place and we probably all learned not the most effective or healthy way to be in relationship, to give love and to receive love. And so for me, it's teaching a lot of communication skills and looking at trauma and looking at like just where, how, how the things we learned in the past really hold us back from getting what we want now. And I love this stuff. I live in Bali, Indonesia now with my amazing family. We've got two kids. My husband's name is Jamin Patel, and we have a conscious marriage. And for us, that means that we are not committed until death do us part. We're really committed to being together so long as we serve each other's highest good, and we're growing together. And we take that very seriously. And if we're feeling it, then we choose to get remarried every calendar year. And we just, let, last year, we had our seventh wedding. And this year I have suggested my idea for how I want to get married this year, which is a little bit more out there, but every year it's <laughs> different. So um, that's a bit about us. And I have a wild background with all sorts of things from doing leadership development to amazon.com for about five years to uh, traveling and speaking over the, all over the world to uh, having lots of crazy experiences around sex positive uh, topics and, um, and grew up very conservative Christian. So it's kind of been all over the board and the adventure has been incredible and it's given me so many different perspectives that I get to bring into my work. Totally. And you know, I have noticed a trend with people who were born into a more traditional Christian family kind of ending up in this realm of things. So it's kind of, kind of interesting no how, that, how that works. <laughs> Um, well, let's kind of get started with you. I mean, we're going to talk about this idea about relearning love, and we're going to be talking about the relationship agreements. But let's 
start with like just the most basic of basic, which is, I guess, childhood and why do we need to relearn love and how does our childhood play into the ways that we understand and experience love? Because, I mean, I know that those two are really connected, but I want you to spell it out for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. My pleasure. You're right. They're super connected. So let me do a little bit of education first, for, and, and many of you probably already know this, but before the age of seven, we all experienced some sort of trauma. And I'm going to say trauma with a little lowercase t. Some of us experienced trauma with a big, an uppercase t. So uh, this is like everybody went through something. And it could have been something as simple as you were lying in your crib and you were crying and your mom came towards you to pick you up. And then the doorbell rang and she turned around to walk away and get the door. And you didn't know what just happened. You didn't have the resources or the skills to handle this amount of rejection and abandonment. And it causes a little riff in us of like, oh my gosh, we're not actually safe. The world is not safe. We thought it was. And so now we develop this new part of our identity. And it's a very, um, it's our survivor self. And it's there to protect us and make sure that we never get hurt again. So it's going to help, help us try to figure out the rules of being human and how to, how to do it well. And unfortunately, while these tools serve us when we're kids, when we aren't adults and we can't make healthy decisions for ourselves, they don't serve us when we're older. And we forget that we have, we can go back to being our healthy selves, our younger selves, when when we could trust and we could create our own safety, not create our own safety, but we had safety. Um, and so for it, for us as we're navigating life, it's like we need to think of ourselves as having three selves. There's our healthy self that we once were and still is in us and we're still capable of. There's our survivor self, which we, you know, that came out of us in that moment of trauma and is there to protect us. And then there's our her wounded self. This is our inner child, that little that little one who got kind of frozen in time. It's never going to go away. He or she or they need to be parented or reparented by us now because they didn't receive the parenting that they needed in that moment. And so we get to go on this journey and look at how are we responding to life and love and relationships as adults now. And maybe the tools we learned back then helped us get here, but they're probably not serving us anymore. There are probably healthier ways to be us and be in connection with other people. And usually we get into a relationship with someone, we attract someone that reminds us in some way of our caregivers. And oftentimes we're looking for something that will match the wound that we carry, right? There's an old wound there that we got from all of our caregivers. We look for a partner that's kind of gotta help us feel comfortable. Like we're gonna be like, oh, I remember that. That feels like something I know and it's very familiar, even if it's painful, or even if we didn't like that about our parents. We're like, but that feels like I know it. I recognize it. So we call it in. And this is what I think a lot of people get tripped up on is if a relationship isn't working, uh, especially after many years of being together, a lot of times people think, oh, I'll just end the relationship and go get another relationship. And yes, you can do that but you're probably gonna call in the same wounds. It'll be different scenarios. The face of the person in front of you will be different, but you're gonna call in the, somebody who will match the same wounds unless you're doing the work to heal that. And you are and you can do that for that other person too, because guess what? Your, your teeth are matching their wounds too. So how can you both learn to say, oh, wow, we've got this. How do we help each other heal and move forward together instead of continuing to just smash into each other's wounds over and over again. Make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, I love that you said like, what was it? Our, our teeth match their wounds. I, I always say like, yeah. our issues are perfect puzzle pieces. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is yes. Great. Um, so, and, and we all have that, right? I mean, like, you know, there are attachment styles and that kind of comes into play to our relationship with our parents. Uh, has a lot to do with how we interact in relationship with other people as adults. Um, Completely. So what are some of the steps? Like when you are working with individuals, do you start like at base, at childhood, talking through that wounding? Like is it just jumping into the either big T or little T trauma right away? <laughs> what's the What's the process? No one's ever asked me that. I like that. Uh, I like this. I'm like, good question. Um, I don't jump into that part. I, I do this education around like, let's talk about it in the broader sense. And then usually we're going to do a little journey together of where did you learn love? 
So let want to be crazy. Let's just let's do a little experiment here on your podcast, which I've never yeah, done before. On let's a podcast. do it. Okay. So anybody who's listening and yourself included, Rachel, I invite you to just close your eyes for a moment and tune in to yourself. Just taking a few breaths, noticing that you are here in this adult body and that you are safe. And we're going to come back to this moment in just a moment. And very gently, I'm going to invite you to rewind time and go back to when you were a kid, whatever that means for you, probably under the age of seven. And just start noticing, like, what were the messages that you received about love and relationships? So we'll start with your parents or caregivers. And just noticing, like, how did they express love or not express love towards each other? And if there was a parent or caregiver who wasn't there, or if neither one of them was there, this is messaging. So just noticing like what, what happened or didn't happen. Did you ever hear them say, I love you? Did they ever touch each other? And then thinking about how they handled conflict. Did they fight? Did they yell? Do they avoid? Just noticing. We don't have to judge how they did it. We just notice the messages that we got. And then thinking about how they showed love to you or didn't show love to you. Did they tell you they love you? Did they hug you? When you fell down, how did they respond? And then beginning to expand beyond your parents and just looking at the movies you watched. What did they say about love? Or the music you listened to? If you grew up in a religious community, what did your faith say? Or any community, what did, what did your community say about love and relationships? How you quote unquote should be. And then from this place, thinking about what you learned or didn't learn in how you learned about yourself, how they learned how to communicate, how you learned about your body. And just taking a moment to realize that all these messages came in very young. You've been absorbing clear messages on how you should or should not be in love and in relationships. And that is ingrained in you, for better or for worse. And just holding all of that with compassion. And when you're ready, I invite you to just begin to let your self fast forward back into your current body, back into your adult self. You're here, you are safe. Whatever happened in your past, it happened. It's a part of you, it's a part of your journey. And it's also part of the medicine that you're bringing with you. It's, it can be the, both the mess and the medicine. And when you're back in this space and you're feeling in yourself, you wiggle your fingers a little bit, taking all that perspective with you. And I invite you to receive a breath and release with any noise or a yawn. <sighs> Let's do one more because it's so nice for our nervous systems. Inhale and release with a noise or a yawn. <sighs> and when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes. We'll be back in this space together. Just with this perspective of like, where are we? Where did we learn love? What came up for you, Rachel? I think, you know, it's so funny that we went through that because I, I learn, I've been relearning a lot of, a lot of love things. You know, my, my first relationship when I was like 14, I think I, he, he was basically like every rom-com times like 30. 
And I thought that's wow. what, what I, yeah, yeah. I thought that's what I uh-huh. was like supposed to have. Like, right. Like uh-huh. I thought that it was supposed to be, <laughs> oh, there should, you should have flowers in your room all the time. And, you know, he should dote on you. And, you know, in retrospect, like he was really controlling. And so it's, it's, this, it's, a, it's this idea that like, you know, the way that I experienced love growing up and, you know, there were some things with my parents going on there as well, but just this idea that like, oh, the way that I thought that love was supposed to be, I realized really early, that's not, I don't want that. I don't want somebody who, yeah. who, you know, controls me or, or dotes on me to the point of thinking that I owe them something. Hmm. Beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. And, and we don't, even, we, we probably, maybe you did. Most of us didn't recognize these patterns when we're in the moment. Right. It's like after the fact, we're like, oh yeah, that wasn't really that great. No. <laughs> huh. Well, no. What I could do differently. No, absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, I would just say we start with l- looking at like, where did you learn love? But then honestly, the biggest place where I take people to right away is around what I call emotional potty training. I love that. (laughs) Because, yeah, because most of us didn't learn how to be with emotions. And I'm, excuse me, I'm going to be a little bit vulgar here, but I'm a mom and I get to talk about poop all the time. Yeah. Um, And the podcast (laughs) is called Wine Dine 69. So you're, you're clear. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But, you know, for most of us, we learned one of two main methods of being with our emotions. One is we hold it all in and we get emotionally constipated until we can't hold it anymore and something triggers us and then we shit all over the place and it really stinks and and everybody around us is impacted. Or the other way is that we get what I call emotional diarrhea. And it's like, oh my God, let me just throw my emotions everywhere all over everybody else. And we didn't take the time to learn how to do emotional potty training, which is there's a way to be with your emotions. There's a way to have emotional hygiene. There's a way to let the emotions be in motion and move through you just like you would for your own health every day. It's like, this is a part of our systems and we don't have to be afraid of it. We don't have to let it control us. We can just look for the messages. Emotions are our messengers. So what are the messages we're trying to be told, trying to receive? Be open to that. Learn how to be with our emotions. And then from a healthy place without being, without coming from a triggered place, how do we share that with ourselves, with our partners, with our kids, like whoever is around you? How do you actually share that? And that's a, a huge skill most of us don't have. And we wonder why being in a relationship is so hard when we're probably doing either the emotional di- or the diarrhea or the emotional constipation method. When really it should be more in the middle, which makes me think about in your book, The Inquire Within Method, which mm-hmm. is way more about instead of the fire hose method where you share all your emotions or... Uh, or the don't ask, don't tell method, which is like, you know, just keep it all. It's it's kind of similar. You want to find like the Goldilocks, the Goldilocks way of expressing emotions, I guess. <laughs> I love that. I love just that. Just right. Yeah, so much. Just right. Yeah, just right. Just right. So mm-hmm. when you're doing this emotional potty training, what are some of the like techniques that you walk people through to try to come to that like more middle equilibrium point? Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, we just talk about emotions and this idea that they, if you have them, it doesn't mean you're crazy. Cause a lot of times we, we like to put those two words together in mm, our yes. culture. Oh, she's so emotional. <laughs> oh, she's acting crazy. I'm like, uh, no, there she's in touch with her, her feelings that are happening right now. And we can talk about how that shows up. But one thing is looking at that and and it's like, what, what are emotions? And we try to say more like messengers. The other thing is we love to stay up in our heads and our mainstream culture. We are so cognitive focused that we kind of cut off anything below here. So it means we're not really connected with our heart most of the time. And we're not really connected with our body most of the time. And if we really want to let things move quickly and efficiently, we need to have the whole system online. So it's how do we connect with that? And how do we tune into, okay, I'm noticing a sensation. What is the sensation? Where do I feel it in my body? And can I tune into that? And if I am becoming flooded, and that's a term I, I use from the Gottman Institute, but if I'm feeling triggered or flooded, there are so many different ways of uh, allowing yourself to be in the experience with it without it having to 
be all over everyone else. And there's lots of different techniques, including having a little time out and saying like, I need to let this emotion move through me or this energy move through me. And, you know, I do some ridiculous things with my clients. And one of my favorite things to do with couples is to um, teach them the art of pillow smacking somebody's ass. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Consensually. Consensually. But sometimes you're like, oh, I have so much anger. And what I see couple, I see a lot of people do is they let their anger hurt someone else. And it's okay to feel angry, but it's not okay to let your anger hurt someone else. So it's yep. one of the main starting points we have. Like, okay, well, what would it be like if I taught you guys how to smack each other's butts with a pillow consensually? And not just like when you need to get some energy out. And there's lots of those. You can hit a pillow by yourself. Great tool. You can go do a hand scream. Mm -hmm. Great tool. Um, but also sometimes it's just fun to do it with your partner. When you're like, I just want to like show them how pissed I am, right? <laughs> it's like, okay. So I, I might say, hey, babe, can I, you know, I, I just, like, we have an, a signal now where I like, pick up a pillow, be like, are you available? Are you available? <laughs> and he knows what that means, you know? And, and, you know, we practice so he can assume the position, which is, looks very much like doggy style. <laughs> Get on all four, put your butt up in the air. And I have a pillow and we've already agreed upon, we've already practiced the pillow. We, I know how hard I can hit even at my hardest if it's okay. And he'll, and he knows to give me a number one to 10, how hard I can go even in my anger. So if he's like, I'm available for six, I know what a six is for him because we practiced when right. I wasn't triggered. Right. Or I know what, a, if he's like all the way, babe, just take it out. And I can, I can go to a 10. I can get my full strength. I know he's going to be okay because we've already practiced when we weren't triggered. So here I am. And I don't use words that would hurt him. Instead, I use my voice to make noises. And in my head, I'm thinking all the nasty things I want to think. But uh, in outer life, I'm just like, ah, and I'm hitting him with a pillow and releasing some anger, getting some of this energy out so that I can come back to a calmer place and look for what the message was underneath that. Because when we're angry, a boundary has been crossed. What was right. the boundary that was crossed? Let's find out. And then let's take that golden nugget and we learn ways of talking and listening to each other with compassion and truth where we get to share that. Say, okay, now here's here's what it is really underneath all that. Instead of you getting yelling at, you getting mad and yelling at them, saying things that hurt them, then they go into their trauma response and nothing gets resolved. We just either sweep it under the rug or wait till another time or it explodes, or, but nothing actually gets to the healing there's just little band-aids that kind of keep you looping. And we really want to get to the to the medicine part of this for you both. Make sense? Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And I love too that, that that method, you know, we were talking about how everything happens up here. It really does bring you into your body and you're using everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're you're expressing yourself verbally, just not with words, and you're expressing yourself mm -hmm. physically. And in a weird way, it's also a connective experience. Exactly. And more often than not, this ends up in laughters and pillow fights and giggles totally. and like ridiculousness. It, and, yeah, it just and, you reminds know, the you. time. Exactly. And which is what you want. You want it to be more of a shared experience instead of something that separates you. You want something that brings you back together. You know, and in any relationship, there's three phases. And I think people just, if people learned this from an early age, it would help normalize our experiences. You know, Disney pretty much painted this picture for us that. All you have to do is find your prince, princess charming and ride off into the sunset and it's easy and there's always harmony. But the truth is that in any relationship, any relationship, there are three phases. There's harmony, disharmony and repair. And you're going to move through them. But the successful relationships are those that are that are moving when they do move into disharmony, they recognize it. They recognize it quickly. And instead of staying there, they are like, we're moving into repair. We have the tools to do the repair quickly and efficiently. We get back to harmony and we celebrate it. And we stay there as long as we possibly can until we need to repeat. But it's like, we stay up here, zoop, and we're back up. Up here, zoop, and we're back up. What I see m most couples do, unfortunately, is the, the harmony is such a blip. It's a moment of joy. It's that Friday night out. And then it goes back into disharmony. And that one argument can keep you looping for days or even weeks. And then you don't have the tools to repair. So you sweep it under the rug, which means that when you go back up to harmony, it's a brief again and nothing ever gets resolved. And so, it, and even if there is repair, it, 
it's like it's a it's a shallow repair most of the time so what i really want yeah. it's a band-aid is for people yeah. to learn how do you do more of that teardrop of like i'm gonna spend most of my time or pyramid i'm gonna spend most of my time way up here uh at the harmony phase and then i'm gonna i know the disharmony is coming welcome it and okay let's move straight into repair spend our time there clean it up and then celebrate yeah, and they do say, I'm not sure if it's the Gottman Institute, which I love that you referenced that so much, um, by the way, the Gottman Institute, I think Tristan Terramino too, who I also love. Um, yeah, she's quite amazing. incredible, incredible. Um, but I was on her podcast I, several years ago. Maybe that's where we met. Maybe each that's other. where, or, maybe that's where, that, that could be where, that could be where, quite honestly, yeah. that I did listen to that <laughs> podcast a lot, actually. So that, that's probably what it was. Um, but they, they usually say that when you, the, the thing that's an indicator of whether a relationship will last is how quickly you're able to resolve arguments effectively. And I think that's the key word. Yes. It's not just solving it, sweeping under the rug, saying, okay, it's it's figuring out, okay, this happened. How do we break down what happened? How can we avoid in the future? What kind of signals can we have to make sure that when we're falling into this pattern, hopefully it won't become a pattern, but assuming that it potentially could, how do we figure out a signal to basically say, hey, we're, we're going to that place again. How do we get ahead of that? Um, yes. So I think that really backs up what you're saying, that being able to spend most of your time in harmony instead of living in. And I could also see I've been in relationships before where I lived in the disharmony. We didn't have the repair tools. But when there were those moments of harmony, it was such a high because it was so rare. Yeah that I wanted to stay in something that I really shouldn't have stayed in. Yeah. And so yeah. it's being able to have those tools, I think is, is really, really incredible. And I don't know, I love, I love how some of the, the, the pillow method and, you know, a lot of the ones that you talk about in, in the relationship agreements, just getting that dialogue started so that you have that language to be able to communicate in that way. Because I think that's, like was my experience when I was listening to your book and when you know my partner and I were listening to it, I just thought, I was like, these are such great tools. I love this. And I think that so many people can benefit from this. And then, you know, I go, ugh, like I wish that more of the world was emotionally intelligent. <laughs> and I think yeah. that's the challenging thing too, is that these are great tools, but, you know, how do you make it accessible to people who, you know, may have more traditional ideas about gender roles or may, you know, be closed off to the idea of communicating or talking about the touchy feely, you know, things. How do you make it accessible yeah. to everybody? Yeah. I, what I, so let me give a little bit of, I think this is really amazing since we've already mentioned Gottman Institute twice. You know, for anybody who doesn't know, the Gottman Institute are the world's leading researchers on couples. And they could tell with like 94% accuracy if a couple will last long term within two minutes of hearing them speak to each other. It is amazing. And with these decades of research, I am always wondering, like, what are they going to do next? And what blows mm -hmm. my mind is their, their, when their company really made a big shift, like, what else are we going to do? It wasn't, it wasn't even to, like, go after singles and teach them. It was literally to create an entire area of educating children about their emotions. Love. They have stuffed animals, they have books, they have a wonderful book called the um, uh, Emotion Coaching. And they are just, it's like, they try to figure out what is the best way to influence couples to have healthy relationships. If you teach children how to be with their emotions, then when they grow up, they can have healthy relationships. And it's like, wow, we're really missing the mark. We're really like, if, at least if, like, where I grew up, that's not the thing that was emphasized, right? It's like, I'm mean, going to learn all the cognitive skills, which yes, they're important, but emotional skills are the things that people are spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on in therapy once they get older. And they're like, why can't I, like, I got the degree, I got the successful job, I own the company. Why can't I have a healthy, why can't I feel less lonely in my marriage? Why can't I feel right. less lonely finding a partner? It's like, because this is the stuff that really matters. So going back to how do you even begin that? 
I like to share that because it really puts things into perspective. I work with a lot of executives and, and uh, I speak at companies like Microsoft and have done some consulting for uh, institutions like MIT. And it's like when we're bringing this sort of data in, when we have enough information that this is really the heart, it starts to change people's minds about the importance of learning these skill sets because it shows up everywhere, not just in the bedroom, but in the boardroom too. So it's like, okay, well, let me just teach you three steps of emotion coaching that I use with my kids. And guess what? They're going to work on you and your partner or partners. <laughs> okay. Ready? Yeah. So the three steps of emotion coaching. The first part is witness. Witness what happened. So I'll give you an example with kids. If one of my kids is running, falls down, scrapes his knee, I would first witness. So, you know, let me pause. When you were a child and you fell down, how would your parents respond? What, what did they do? Can you, can you remember it all? How would they yeah. respond if something happened? Yeah, my, my mom was really good at, you know, being like, oh, sweetie, like, you know, I'm so sorry, you know, kiss it, make it better. Um, yeah. You know, like, what, what, can, what can we do? What do you need? Like, she was very, very good at that type of thing. Um, you know, my dad was at work a lot, so I don't really have any memories of, of him being necessarily the person, but, you know, as I've gotten yeah. older, he's definitely been, um, the person who emotionally when I'm hurt, maybe not falling down physically, but when I'm emotionally hurt, he's definitely been, been present. But as a kid, yeah, my mom, my mom was pretty good at that. Beautiful. That's awesome. I see a lot of parents do one of two main things that, can be a little bit hard to understand as a child. One of them is they'll say, oh my gosh, oh no, my child is freaking out. I need to distract them. Oh, look at the shiny ah. toy, right? It's like anything to get them to stop crying because I feel uncomfortable they're crying and I don't want them to cry. I don't want them to have this experience. We don't, we don't want people to have pain. And I understand that. But pain is how we grow and how we learn and the message is happening right here. So the first one is people try to distract or they'll or they will try to invalidate the experience. You're fine. Stop crying. It's okay. You're okay. Which is not true. They're crying. They just fell down. So what we want to do is first, instead of trying to distract them away from what's actually happening or create some other sort of lie, instead we want to help them be present with, with the right now and the whatever they're feeling is valid. So I'm just going to, I'm going to witness the first step witness. Oh, you were running so fast. You fell down and you scraped your knee. Second step, I'm going to empathize. Uh, sorry, I'm going to name the emotions. So that, and I name the emotions. If they're over the age of five, they can usually start to name their own emotions. If they're under the age of five, I start helping give them words. You're probably feeling really sad and scared, and you're in pain. Um, you know, uh, and maybe you're feeling uh, nervous. You know, so I'll I'll like guess the emotions. And then the third step is to empathize where I will just say, when have I felt something similar? And I didn't mm -hmm. have to have the exact same experience, but I can try to think of what I felt similar emotions at the same time, that concoction. Let's say, oh, I could say, oh yeah, when I'm running and I've fallen down, I have also felt bad and scared and really hurt. And you know, sometimes I also feel really embarrassed that I wonder if anybody saw me, right? Um, and if I haven't had that exact same experience, I can just go to the emotions. I have, I have also felt sad and scared and in pain before. I get it. That makes sense to me. That's it. The, the fourth step, which is optional, is to ask, is there anything you need? Mm -hmm. anything you need? Do you want to kiss? Do you want to hug? Right? But usually by the time I get through all three, and if I tack on the fourth, which sometimes they need it, sometimes they don't care, um, they're like, cool, thanks for seeing me. I'm out. You know, I'm going to go play again. And, and so then you take this knowledge, and you're like, I wonder how this works with my partner. So your partner comes home, had a rough day at work. Okay, first thing we're going to do is we're going to witness. Okay, oh, babe, you had a really rough day at work and, you're, and you got a tough email and, you know, you didn't sleep well last night. Wow, I see all that happened to you. Then you're going to name the emotions, have them name the emotions. Oh, you're feeling really stressed and sad and angry and frustrated. Ugh. And then you're going to empathize. Oh, yeah, I, I've felt that way before too. I can totally relate with how it feels to feel stressed and angry and tired and, and just, oh, that's a lot. Is there anything you need? Done. Yeah. Try it. Emotional. Yeah. 
and and then because you you know the power of self love and self care and we talked about that a little bit about how it's so important use the same thing on yourself so the other Ooh. day i was driving in my motorbike because in bali we drive motorbikes and i almost got into an accident didn't thank goodness but you know yeah, the wow. the way that i grew up was like push through it you're fine it wasn't an accident keep going and my body was having a different response. I had adrenaline and all this stuff, which would make driving clear headed very difficult. So instead, I'm like, I give myself permission to be in this moment and be present and to feel all the feels. So I pulled over to the side of the road, turned off my bike, and I gave myself 30 second permission to just be there. And I was like, okay, first I witness. So I'm like, okay, what just happened? I almost got in hit. I almost got hit by this other bike. Wow. And I'm feeling really shaken up. So the second one is, how am I feeling? Okay, well, I'm definitely feeling shaken up, scared, nervous, adrenaline filled. Like I'm kind of freaking out right now um, and grateful all at the same time. And then I'm going to empathize. When has a previous version of me experienced something similar that I can empathize with in my life? Oh, shoot. I'm remembering about that time when I was 18 and I got in a car accident and I got whiplash. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can totally re re like empathize with this part of myself that's freaking out right now. And I can and I can ask myself, is there anything I need? I need to just breathe for a moment and not get back in traffic. And I'm just going to like put on a calm song or just be here for another 10 seconds. And then it moves through. Or maybe I just stand up and shake my hands, you know, just move some energy out. Okay. And now it's done. And I can hop on my bike and I can keep moving. And instead of that energy being stuck inside of me and me getting a neck ache later on, now it's been, it's moved and I probably won't get a neck ache later on or get a headache or develop an ulcer because I'm holding all the emotions in. I'm letting things keep moving through my system and letting it go. Life is much more peaceful and I feel seen, heard, loved, and validated, which is really nice. Yes. It's so funny. Like when you were talking about the the – the, you know, when you get hurt and, and when you're as a kid and you get hurt, I was reminded of a few months ago, I was hanging out with uh, some, some friends of my partners and they have a, a daughter and she, you know, we were out to brunch or something and she like pinched her finger or something like, you know, something that probably was horrific for her, but you know, five, 15 years from now, it's a blip. And yeah. uh, she wanted you know her her parents to to kiss her finger and she you know put them oh. to her parents but then like i watched her and she would i'm glad this is on video so you can see what i'm doing she would she would like stop crying a little bit and then she'd look at her finger and go <laughs> and in that moment <laughs> i was like i was like oh i think that she wants kisses from everybody at the table she wants everybody to see her <laughs> it's not just her parents she wants everybody to see her and to witness and so you know my partner and i mm. like kiss her finger and then she then she feels better but it was it just reminds me in that moment that sometimes like you really just want to be seen oh my and gosh yes that's true for kids that's true for especially i think like as adolescents wow like what a fucking awful time in my life um but then as adults too like you so frequently want to be seen and i think that's why you know my partner and i are really good at asking do you want solutions or do you want to be heard. Which one is it? Yes. Oh. Which I think would would solve so many problems if people, you know, knew how to because it's easy to hear it, right? But when you're in the middle of trauma, little t trauma, you know, it's a completely another thing to have that come in and say, wait a sec, let me remember my tools from my toolbox and to bring them into play. Um Completely. Do you have any tips for that? Like how to, you know, we have these tools, you have you know, this great book about these different tools for relationship agreements, but then in the heat of the moment, how do you apply them? What's a good way to like recall them back? And I know, I know one of the ones that you're going to use, but. Uh, do you? Like, I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one of the one is like just being like, all right, like let's take a time out. Just knowing when to pause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that in and yeah. itself is a reminder <clears throat> that let's revisit our actual toolbox. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to, I'm going to give, an, I'm going to paint a picture for you because I'm finding that this is really landed with a lot of my clients right now. And so I'm going to paint a picture first and then we'll talk about this pause. But 
going back to this idea that we just want to be seen. We all want to be seen, heard, and loved. And how do little kids be seen, heard, and loved? They throw a tantrum if they're not being seen, heard, and loved. So they right. do get seen, heard, and loved. <laughs> Maybe not loved in the way they want, but they're getting the attention, right? And guess what? Whenever we are picking a fight with our partner, we're throwing a tantrum. Whenever we're going into our fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, fawning mean people pleasing, these mm -hmm. trauma responses are tantrums. They are our call for attention. They are our call for we just want to be seen, heard, and loved and feel safe. So I love this analogy. Imagine that you go to a park, a playground. There's a bench there and there's a sandbox. And normally the adults sit on the bench and watch the children play in the sandbox. So if you're in your healthy adult self, you're sitting on the bench and your partner is sitting next to you. But when one of you gets triggered, could be by the other person or just in life, it's like they choose to get up off of the bench and jump into the sandbox. Now they're having their freak out, right? Yeah. This is their fight, flight, freeze, fawn. They're throwing sand, they're shouting, everything's happening. They're having their experience and lots of big emotions. If you are in your healthy adult self, you can look at the kid and be like, oh, their, their sand castle got knocked over. They're having a real hard time. You know, like I'm gonna make sure they're safe and they don't choke on any sand. I'm here, I'm gonna tell them they're loved, right? And it's all good and they calm down and then they come and then they start playing again or get out of the sandbox. But what usually happens in partnerships is one person jumps in the sandbox and they start throwing sand. And the other person is like, I think that kid just threw sand at me. Yep. And then they decide I'm going to get off the bench and get in the sandbox too. So you've got two triggered children freaking out, throwing sand at each other and screaming. This is where we cannot solve anything. This is when we are not acting from a rational, healthy place. We're working from our wounded child self that's freaking out. So what I say is it's not wrong to be in the sandbox. Everybody needs to turn the sandbox. But what we really want to do is learn the skills so that one of you can be in the sandbox and one of you is on the bench. And then you're going to get a turn to switch. And that yeah. is what he healthy relationships are. And so if you notice you're getting pulled into the sandbox, talk, like have this be a, a conversation you you all have together. It's like, oh, I'm going to the sandbox. Okay, cool. We have a signal for that. You know, like time out or a little heart symbol or push on your mm -hmm. nose or whatever it may be for like, I'm going in the sandbox. And you guys can practice what is what works for you. And every couple is different. And, you know, everybody has their own unique background. So you have to find what works for you. A timeout signal for one couple may be like, awesome, no problem. And a timeout signal for somebody else may remind them of their baseball coach when they were eight and it's like traumatic, right? And so you don't do that sign. So you find what works for you. And for some people, a timeout where you're moving your body to a different room can be traumatic. They feel like they're being left or abandoned. But for some people, it's like exactly what they need. So you have to talk about these things and practice before you're triggered. And then when the triggers do happen, they're more ingrained in your body. And you can talk about it afterwards. How did that go? When I just stepped into the other room, but you could see me sitting there through the doorway, how did that feel? Mm. When, when we tried doing the pillow hitting exercise on our own, but next to each other, how did that feel? Right? It's like you guys can find out what works for you. And there's so many different techniques that we play with. We want to be love scientists. I think I love that we that. lose that curiosity. Yeah. Like there's so much there and your partner's a unique person, you're a unique person and you're changing all the time. So how can we be curious about like, what would work for us? Let's try this out. I heard this on a podcast. Ari said, let's smack each other's butts with pillows. How do we do that in a way to see if it feels good? And if you're like, nope, that's not for me. That reminds me of something that does not feel good to me. Great. Don't do it. Take what mm -hmm. works for you and get rid of the rest. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I love, love scientists. I mean, that's what the Gottman Institute is, right? And yes. I mean, also mm -hmm. like I think of uh, – Elaine de Baton and the School of Life. I feel like they're kind of doing a similar, mm -hmm. a similar theme with like relationships and and they have a, a line of books for children about processing emotions as well, which is yeah. I just love I just love that. I think that that you're right. That's where it starts. Yeah. We have to teach we have to teach children to process things in a healthy way and validate them too. I feel like so much of the time we are invalidating children because it's exhausting being a parent. <laughs> But also, yeah. you know, it's just you, you just 
want to move forward and it might feel like a small deal to to us but it's it's their world so yeah it's important yeah to keep and that. i find as a as a parent i find that taking the extra 30 seconds to go through the emotion coaching gives me much better results than when i was push trying to push through and just yeah. being like we have to go like it's not worth it it will turn into an all-day fight instead of something that was resolved where they feel loved right? Absolutely. So I think in our minds, because it's not how we were raised, again, we, we do what we learned, right? If our parents did it a certain way, part of us really believes that's how we should do things. Right. All right. And so, so looking at like what actually works for you and be that love scientist with your children, be that love scientist with your partner, be that love scientist with yourself. Okay. What would it be like if I emotion coached myself in the bathroom after a really tough meeting at work. Okay, I can do that. What is it like to hold myself in that in that regard and not put it on my partner or not bring it home or bring home just the golden nuggets of what I need? Babe, I had a rough day at work and I processed so much and I just really need to be held. Can you just wrap me up in your arms for the next half an hour? Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Being aware of what you need, which I think is half of the battle most of the time. First half of the oh battle is knowing it. And then the second half is communicating it. Yeah. Asking for it. And then, yep. and then receiving it can be super hard too. Oh yeah. No, I, think, I mean, who knew? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> who knew? It's something I'm learning in, in my current relationship that receiving love is I'm used to being the giver. I'm not used to receiving. Right. So when, yeah. when it's time to receive, I'm just like, I don't know how to do this. This is, this is weird and different. Um, How does it feel for you? Yeah. Like what happens in your body with your, if somebody wants to give you something, like what happens? What's your experience? Oh, man. Like I remember I was first dating my partner, maybe like a couple months in and, and he asked, you know, Hey, like what kind of um, product should I get like to keep at my place that you use? Like, is there a specific kind of face wash or like tampons or pads that you use? Like what, um, what can I get? Or do you have a sp specific shampoo that you like have a preference for that I should get? Uh -huh. And I was just, I just looked at him like, <laughs> and listeners can't see, but it just was like this look like, I don't, I don't know what to do. Like, I was just like, I was like, I'm used to like just bringing that stuff. Like when I, when I need to, he was like, yeah. well, yeah, but like, I want to like, I want to like do something for you. I want, I want, you know, you to have it readily available. You still have to cart stuff back and forth between our places. That's and so I was, sweet. I was just like, I was just like. I, I rejected it at first. I was like, no, I'm I'm good. I like I like being in in control of of this. But now, <laughs> now I'm like, oh hey, I'm gonna leave this at your place now. Oh hey, I'm gonna leave this at your place now. Oh hey, do you mind picking this up for me? <laughs> so that's your place. But it was really difficult to learn how to do that. I, I was just like, I don't I I don't know what to do with that. It's totally different. Yeah. Yeah. I think most of us feel more comfortable giving, yeah. right? We feel like we have more control. Like we feel like we're, we get that good feeling like we're doing something amazing, but there's so much shaming that comes with receiving or little. It's like, you know, you're supposed to say, Oh no, no, no. Thank you. No, no. Right, or to give right. a compliment back. They, they're like, you, I love that shirt. And you're like, Oh, I love that shirt on you. <laughs> right? Thanks. Like, I love your shoes. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. It's like, or you deflect well, by wait. saying my dress has pockets. <laughs> right. Like, Oh, there's something wrong with it. There's something wrong with me. There's, or, you know, it's something that minimizes when we don't receive gracefully it, the other person feels smaller. They feel like their gift wasn't received. And and yet we are told that that is the more honorable thing to do, to look right. humble and selfless by not receiving. So it's this weird thing of like, wouldn't you love it if somebody gave a gift to you that you like put your heart into was like, oh my God, thank you. And mm -hmm. just took it without deflecting or putting it back on you or just receive it. And that is an art. There's an art to receivership. And so practicing that and being aware can also clear up a lot of these feelings of rejection that happen a lot in relationships. We don't know how many misses we're, we're, we're having in a day. If somebody's like, baby, I bought you this coffee. And you're like, oh, you shouldn't have, you know, even though in your heart, you're like, that was awesome. You're like, like that was so nice. Say, yeah. Thank you. That's it. All you have to do is say thank you. And it can change the trajectory of how you guys are going to connect the rest of the day. Absolutely. No, I, I love that. I absolutely love that. And I'm I'm working to 
do more of that just because being the giver for so long, my partner and I joke that we're like the same person because we're just like, oh, like it's weird, like dating another giver. It's we're both adjusting. So, uh huh. Um, in Way terms of yeah, it's 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 work. <laughs> you wouldn't think that receiving yeah. is work, but it is work. In terms of like relearning love, I mean, one of the ways in which you re relearn love, you wrote the entire book, um, Relationship Agreements. What is the benefit? I think a lot of people might be like, oh, like what about spontaneity or what about, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm a type A personality, so I love, you know, having these things mapped out for me. But I, you know, know people who might be like, oh, like, you know, that doesn't have the same like sexiness or whatever to it. Um, what, do you, what are the benefits of having a planned and organized, I hesitate to say contract, but it is in a way. Yeah, I would say this. I'm going to not even, I'll, I'll take it to a relationship agreement specifically in a moment, but let me just say that I hear people push back often and be like, I don't want to have a set way of doing something. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, I hate to break your bubble, but you already have a set way of doing something. Oh yeah. It just isn't working. <laughs> it's just Right. So it's like, when you start looking at it, like I can talk to a couple and like by the end of the call, I know their patterns. Give me a half an hour with a couple and I will know what your patterns are and probably a lot more than you even are aware of about where they came from and why they're there and how they're not serving you anymore. Right. So if I, if the patterns are that easy to pick up on, you're in a pattern. So break the idea that having a clear agreements or learning how to communicate using tools that have been studied and proven to work. There's just going to be a different way from you doing what you're doing right now, which is your old way of being which isn't serving you, learn a new way of being. I remember when my husband, uh, I, we started you know, dating and stuff, and I'm like, you have to learn this tool, this communication tool. You have to learn how to do reflective listening. You have to learn how to say this thing. And he was just so resistant. He's like, no one talks like that. It sound, you sound ridiculous. Like, no <laughs> one talks like that. And I was like, you're right. No one talks like that. And I wish they did. You know, yeah. and, and then we kept having these same conflicts over and over again. And finally, one day, I think he was so exhausted from the conflict continuing. And he just said the thing. Like, he just did it. And everything went, boom. All the charge left. We connected. I was like, I broke down. I like, I mean, all the connection came in. The harmony just was like, it just happened. And he, his jaw hit the ground. He was like, oh, my God. Why don't people talk like this all the time? Uh -huh. I'm like, uh huh. I know. <laughs> so why not? And and then the same thing goes for people who are like, but I want more spontaneity. I'm like, you don't have to get rid of the spontaneity. You can if there's somebody who really loves spontaneity. Like sometimes I'll say, okay, block a day, block a half a day, block whatever mm -hmm. it is that's just spontaneity time. Like we don't know what's gonna happen, but we know we're protecting our time together. We're creating the space and we're protecting it. Cause what happens is most people are like, we'll just wait till we're spontaneously aligned. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that. Especially if you have a career, are passionate about anything in life, enjoy like your free time or have children, any like that, the spontaneity factor like only is risk. So instead schedule mm -hmm. spontaneity time. You still get to have it all. It's okay. So, <laughs> yeah, that makes no, sense. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I think that's such a an interesting thing to be able to do too. Is to say, all right, this is the time where we're going to be spontaneous. This is the time where we're going to allow whatever comes up to come up. Because I mean, that's why the honeymoon phase is the honeymoon phase is because you're so dialed uh -huh. into that partner that you can be spontaneous all the time. Because totally you're so like, they're your number one priority during that time. Yes. And so. if you are still each other's number one priority, then by all means say, Ari, we don't need that. <laughs> like, we're spontaneous still all the time. Great. But life and happens. When it comes to but life happens. It mm -hmm. does. And the new relationship energy wears off and turns yep. into mature relationship energy. And that's when you need to be more protective of your team, of your teammate. So what I want to say about relationship agreements specifically to talk about in context of spontaneity, it's like you already have agreements. They're probably just not written down. They're unspoken. Oh, yeah. That's it. So, so instead it's like, this is a living document, which is going to give you more freedom and safety to evolve. You can keep evolving because I'm guessing you're not the same people as you were six months ago or six mm -hmm. years ago. 
but you're going to keep evolving. So allow this living document to evolve with you and check in as like, how is this working for us? Or is this an assumption or an expectation we have for each other? If there's any hint of judgment, if there's a sense that they're judging you or you're judging them, this is that just means red flag. We need to be curious about this. And when we're curious and we talk about it, then we can come to a new agreement together and you don't have to make it forever. It's like until we revisit the agreement again. And you can say, we're going to revisit it every three months or we're going to check in on this a week from now and see how the new agreement went. But this is really where you get to have that freedom and safety to be authentically yourselves, which you don't get if you don't have the clarity in the communication. 100%. Yeah, no, I I love that. And I love everything that we've talked about today. Um, Are there any last things that you want people to know about relationship agreements or about relearning love that you think is important for, for them to know that they might not? Hmm. Great question. I would just, I think I, we covered almost all the big major like foundational pieces, yes. <laughs> but just that I just want to say like, if you don't feel like you're really getting this love and relationships thing, like a hundred percent, it's okay. It's not your fault. You already learned some pretty poor ways of doing things. Right. Everybody did. We just don't talk about it unless you listen to podcasts like this and are like surrounding yourself with people who want to geek out on this stuff. Right. As somebody who does this for a living with people all over the world every day, I can tell you this is a normal thing. So understanding that it's not your fault. And now you have the opportunity with this awareness that you can go out and relearn love. You can do this. You're totally capable. And I believe in you. So make a choice a very conscious choice that you want to do things in a different way and go find the best tools and resources out there for you. And that may be working with a coach. It may be working with a therapist. It may be really digging into your past, but really what I encourage you to do is find the right fit for you and not look for a Band-Aid solution, but something that's actually going to get to the heart of the matter and help you really in love so that you get a lasting, a lasting change. Like I always tell my clients, it's like, My program is four months long. And at the end, I want you to not need me. I want Mm -hmm. you to just feel so grounded and you have the tools and the resources that you can face anything together. Now, if you want me still, that's different. And we can talk about that, right? And I've got some clients I've worked with now for going on one eight-year anniversary and one four-year anniversary was this past week. It's like there's more depth always there. But just looking for what really works for you and how you really are in love. And um, I'll just share that, like, I'm happy to give anybody who's listening a, a free gift of my new uh, masterclass called Teammates. And it really talks about what are these big shifts that people who can think about being a team, who have relearned love, who can really prioritize and protect their team, how they think and how, what has happened for them. So ah, I'll make it okay. available for all you guys if you want it. Um, it's there and you're welcome to listen to it. And, you know, as I say with everything, Take what works for you and let go of the rest. Yeah. No, I'll put that in the episode notes for sure. Um, and yeah, Ari, where can people find you? Well, you can find me at reallyinlove.com and on Instagram at Coach Ari Cardosh. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your expertise and all these tools. Um, I know that between your book and this conversation, I've taken a lot away. Uh, my partner is going to come over in just a few minutes, so I'm ready to geek out and sit down and have a conversation about all of this. <laughs> He's excited too. He he was because he was listening to the book and he was like, "Oh my gosh!" And he was like, "You need to tell me everything." You know, I want to know before the episode comes out. So, uh, we'll uh, to, I love it. We'll have to sit down and talk about it. But um, thank you so much for coming on and and sharing. I know that it's late where you are, so I appreciate my you making pleasure. the time. I'm so glad we could share this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who's tuning in and listening. (laughs) Yes. Thank you, listeners. Uh, You have been listening to Wine, Dine, and 69. I'm your host, Rachel Dalton, and let's keep talking.